Welcome. My name is Alfreda and I'm joined by my colleague Kate. Hi. And we are part of the global GBV IMS technical team. This resource is available both as a podcast and video short. This episode on adapting GBV referral pathways is part of a series on case management in the context of COVID-19. For the full episode, check out our website at www.gbvims.com. This episode aims to provide a practical support to GBV service providers, as well as the interagency GBV coordination body and country, so either the GBV subsector or cluster, depending where you are, to adapt the referral pathway in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is important to remember during this episode that the COVID-19 response looks very different depending on the country, region and humanitarian setting in which you're working in. It's important, therefore, that this guidance is adapted to your particular context and is reflective of the COVID-19 response on ground. We'll start off the episode by introducing why referral pathways need to be updated during COVID-19 then look at key considerations to take when assessing organisational capacity, as well as context-specific questions to inform the adaptation or revision of your referral pathway. Finally, we'll briefly touch on the dissemination of your referral pathway to ensure that it is accessible to service providers and survivors during COVID-19. Why do the referral pathways need to be updated? Services and infrastructure mapping is critical to allow organizations to determine appropriate referrals for survivors as part of the multi-sectoral response to gender-based violence. In many contexts before COVID-19, a referral pathway or service mapping already existed. However, Depending on national strategies being implemented to combat COVID-19, for example, partial or complete lockdown, GBV actors at the field level are having to shift modalities for how they provide GBV case management. These changes, whatever they are, must be captured and reflected in your referral pathway. For example, your referral pathway should reflect if some service providers will be providing remote GBV case management services over the phone or through a hotline. It is therefore important to map available services and capacity in each location, looking at what services were in place prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, which of them will still continue to provide services, whether or not these services are safe, for example, do they uh, comply with best practices and partial or complete lockdown? Are they survivor centered? And which of them would stop service provision during this time? In some contexts, time to revise the existing referral pathway may be limited. So prioritize service providers for health, psychosocial support, GBV case management, and safety or security actors. Remember that strong coordination with other GBV and non-GBV actors will not only result in a comprehensive mapping of GBV services, but ensure that survivors can be made aware of the services that will still be available to them during COVID-19. Let's take a look at what this means in a practical sense. As already stated, a referral pathway or service mapping most likely existed in your context before the onset of the global pandemic. But now you need to ascertain whether or not organizations including it, included in it will continue to meet the needs of survivors during COVID-19. This would determine whether you include them in your referral pathway or not and allow you to collect specific information on how the service is provided in the new context. It will also allow you to collect information on more non-traditional remote services. This means making contact with existing and new GBV service providers and non-GBV actors providing services to GBV survivors during COVID-19 to better understand and document the types of support each is able to provide. Are in-person GBV case management services still offered? Is it remote or mobile based now? 
The limitations of service delivery within the context of COVID-19 also need to be understood. For example, are there reduced staff at common entry points like women and girls safe spaces? Are there entry points like health centres that expose survivors to risk of COVID-19 infection? Or maybe there are specific services that lack um, good IPC policies. In place where there is a lockdown, sometimes citizens are authorised to move only one kilometre from their home, whereas services might be located further. Or some people may require permits to move out of their homes. These COVID specific considerations are just as important to document as things as whether or not the staff speak the local dialect and whether or not there are any limitations in service delivery. For example, maybe they were able to provide escorted services before, but they're no longer providing this service. The mandatory reporting requirements also need to be understood that, so that cases, that services need to adhere to. For example, the mandatory reporting requirements in, in instances of abuse of minors or um, whether or not there are, are illegal immigrants, as well as their attitude and capacity to provide services to otherwise marginalized populations, if this is relevant in your context. This includes migrants, sex workers, disabled people, or those in the LGBTQI community. I'll allow Kate to take you through how to assess organizations remotely. When assessing organizations remotely, the methodology will vary by context. Many of the methods used will not be new. It is more a matter of eliminating those that are no longer feasible. But for example, if in your context, visual observation can still be done without putting yourself or others at risk, then this type of information collection can still be done. For contexts like most of us are now in, assessment information collection will need to be done completely remotely. This will require the use of phones, online internet platforms, and conferencing technologies where available. For example, when conducting key informant interviews or KIIs, phones and platforms such as SurveyMonkey can be used instead of in-person interviews. If you are in a context with very accessible internet, virtual focus group discussions of caseworkers could be conducted to get a clear idea of how services are being conducted and the risks uh, faced by service providers and quality. Coordination should continue to be utilized as a major source of information. Five W's can be updated with additional COVID-19 questions such as modifications due to the movement restrictions, staff reductions, and site closings, etc. to gather information. If an organization is already collecting client satisfaction surveys, they could add additional questions to identify clients' access and perceptions of safety and quality when accessing the services during these restricted times. Resources of how to safely do assessments remotely can be found in the IRC GBB remote and mobile service guidance note, found at the link provided in this PowerPoint. Additional questions more specific to your context during COVID-19 are presented here and are also good to know when updating your referral pathway. Consider social distancing policies put in place, such with questions such as, what community activities will continue, if any? Will women's group activities continue? Are GBB services considered essential services in your context? Does this impact survivors' access? Is emergency contraception available at pharmacies? What other organizations exist locally? Are there transport or movement restrictions? Are there curfews? Will there still be community-based or alternative safe transportation options? Do different populations have access to the necessary documentation to access services or to move if necessary, i.e. permits? This type of information will need to be used to complement traditional information collected for referral pathways. It will allow you to understand if services will be accessible in light of the restrictions and if 
alternative entry points or services could be options. Once you've gathered all of the information, it is time to update your referral pathways. It goes without saying, but don't forget to include the name of the organization and focal point, phone number, email address, physical address if applicable, the services offered, the days and hours of service, and costs of service. You can also ad uh, note additional considerations or notes. It's important to consider that sometimes you might need to add in additional considerations for hotlines, such as under cost of service, noting if a hotline is not toll free, or indicating whether or not operators are specifically trained on gender-based violence. And also, you need to consider the format. Remember that women and girls face increased challenges in accessing information, and your referral pathway has to cater to that. So will your referral pathway be digital or paper-based, pictorial or text-based? Do you need to make provisions for translating the resource into local languages? You know your context and will be in a much better position to know what works best. Please remember that before including the details of an organization or a focal point, they must give consent and be notified that their contact details may be offered to survivors wishing service and may be accessible to the public. It also goes without saying that monitoring service provision during this time is crucial. The COVID-19 situation remains fluid, and as such, you will need to review your referral list weekly to ensure that the mapping you've done is up to date. I'm now going to hand it over to Elfrida for her to explain a little bit more about the dissemination of your referral pathway. Thanks. Travel restrictions and social distancing measures being adopted due to COVID-19 may, may result in reduced capacity for in-person service delivery. However, various channels existed before the pandemic and should still be explored now to get the word out there about the services that would still be available to support survivors of gender-based violence. Consider using mobile technologies for sharing of information through SMS or audio MMS messaging. If there is mobile internet access, this option can also be explored for sending and sharing information. However, in low resource settings, survivors may not have access to large data bundles. Ensure that the content is produced in a low resolution format with minimum file size. And also consider using existing social media content channels, such as Facebook or WhatsApp. For example, in one country, there's a website for each location that service providers operate that can be updated automatically by each service provider. And also in other contexts, or in another context, there's a public service an announcement through SMS messages that are sent to ed everyone. And this is a good way to reach a wide audience and allow individuals to know how to get information on accessing GBV services. Coordinating with the local authorities, NGOs, and other community organizations to identify common and uncommon entry points with sur which survivors may use is also paramount. These include pharmacies, health centers, and women and girls safe spaces if they're still operational. And ensure that the focal points in these services have the updated referral list and know how to use it. For example, explore mounting fixed site loudspeakers at sites where staff would still operate, or even using loudspeakers at public locations. For example, most mosques have loudspeakers. Things like posters can also be printed and mounted at common entry points. And if this is not possible, handwritten information on a whiteboard or a flip chart can be equally as useful. All frontline workers in particular, this would be those indicated on your referral pathway, 
or in the case of remote service provision, such as hotlines, anyone who would be responsible for responding to calls, should have training on receiving GBV survivors and have access to accurate, up-to-date information to facilitate safe and confidential referrals to available GBV services. Remember, we want to create an environment where the survivor is empowered to make an informed decision as to whether she wishes to accept or decline a service. Kate, could you let us know what we should do if we're working in, an, in, a, in a context where a GBV actor or a referral pathway is not available? Yes, I can. Um, finally, we recognize that since the onset of COVID-19 in many contexts, access to specialized GBV services has considerably reduced. If a GBV actor or referral pathway is not available in a context, please refer your colleagues to the companion guide to the IASC GBV guidelines, how to support survivors of gender-based violence when GBV actors are not available in your area. It's a step-by-step -step pocket guide for humanitarian practitioners. We would like to thank you for listening to us today. To find out more about the series on case management in the context of COVID-19, you can find the full episode and check out our website at gbvims.com. And as always, be responsible with your data. Thank you. Thank you.